This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 119. Coming up on Space Time, NASA back in touch with its Voyager 2 spacecraft, the mystery of the centaurs, and the meaning of a blue moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has re-established command control of the Voyager 2 spacecraft. The agency's 70-metre Canberra Deep Space Network radio dish, the only antenna capable of contacting the 43-year-old spacecraft, successfully sent a series of commands to the probe. The dish, officially known as Deep Space Station 43, has been undergoing a major upgrade and refurbishment since mid-March. With the dish out of action, mission managers could receive data from Voyager 2 through the three 34-metre wide radio antennas at the Canberra complex, but couldn't send commands to the far-flung probe, which has now left our solar system and is flying through interstellar space. Among the upgrades to the DSS-43 dish were two new radio transmitters. One of them, which is used to talk to Voyager 2, hasn't been replaced in more than 47 years. Engineers have also upgraded heating and cooling equipment for the electronics, the power supply equipment and other technology needed to run the new transmitters. The successful call to Voyager 2 is just one indication that the dish will be back online as scheduled in February next year. Located near Canberra, the antenna is part of a network of three radio antenna ground stations, the other two being Goldstone in California and Madrid in Spain. The network are primarily used to communicate with spacecraft operating beyond Earth orbit. The positioning of the three facilities around the planet ensures that almost any spacecraft in line of sight with Earth can communicate with at least one of the facilities at any time. Voyager 2 is a rare exception. Launched in 1977, just days before its twin Voyager 1, the spacecraft was designed to achieve nothing less than the ultimate grand tour of the outer solar system visiting the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn, and then the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. In order to make a close flyby of Neptune's moon Triton in 1989, the probe flew over the planet's North Pole. The gravitational impact of that trajectory deflected it southwards relative to the plane of the planets, and it's been heading in that direction out of the solar system and into interstellar space ever since. Now, more than 18.8 billion kilometres from Earth, the Voyager 2 spacecraft is so far south, it no longer has line of sight with radio antennas in Earth's northern hemisphere. So, DSS-43 is the only dish in the southern hemisphere with a transmitter powerful enough, and that broadcasts at the right frequencies, to send commands to the distant spacecraft. Voyager 2's faster-moving twin Voyager 1 took a different path past Saturn and can communicate through the antennas at the two DSN facilities in the Northern Hemisphere. The antennas need to uplink commands to both Voyagers in a radio frequency range called S-band, and the antennas downlink data from the spacecraft in a range known as the X-band. The probes are constantly sending back science data from interstellar space, that is, the region of the galaxy immediately outside the Sun's heliosphere, a protective bubble of particles and magnetic field created by the Sun that surrounds the planets and the Kuiper Belt, a collection of small icy bodies beyond the orbit of Neptune. DSS-43 began operating back in 1972, five years before the launch of the Voyager 2 and Voyager 1 spacecraft. Back then, it was only 64 metres wide, the same size as the Parkes radio telescope dish. It was expanded to 70 metres in 1987 and has received a variety of upgrades and modifications since then. The engineers overseeing the current work say this has been one of the most significant makeovers the dish has received and the longest it's been offline in 30 years. Philip Baldwin Operations Manager for NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program says the DSS-43 antenna is a highly specialised system. He says there are only two other similar antennas in the world. So having the antenna down for a full year is not an ideal situation for Voyager or for any of the other major NASA missions currently in operation. The Canberra Deep Space Communications Network Complex is managed by the CSIRO on behalf of NASA. 
Complex spokesperson Glenn Nagel says the refurbishment of DSS-43 will benefit other missions, including NASA's Mars Perseverance rover, which will land on the Red Planet on February the 18th next year, and the upcoming Artemis missions, which will return humans to the surface of the Moon in 2024 and eventually onto Mars. As part of the ongoing upgrades for our big 70-metre dish, one of those was to actually test that we could send commanding to the Voyager 2 spacecraft that big antenna, Deep Space Station 43, being the only antenna in the world capable of doing that. And why is it the only one that can reach a Voyager 2? After the Voyager 2 spacecraft encountered Neptune back in 1989, its trajectory took it southward below the ecliptic plane. And so it's gone now so far south that for our two stations in the Northern Hemisphere in Spain and California, Literally, the Earth is in the way, so they're unable to see the spacecraft. And I take it the 34-metre dishes simply aren't big enough. So not capable to transmit not with high-power transmission capability. They uh-huh. still can receive, if we combine two of them, to receive data from Voyager 2. So we've still known it's been there for the last eight months that we've been offline from commanding. But now with 43, our big dish back online, we can send those vital commands again. And what was the refurbishment done to the big dish? So during this upgrade, a lot of equipment has been operating the antenna, antenna for over 40 years. So some of the transmitters were in that sort of age group and they were desperately in need of an upgrade. So we installed two new high-powered transmitters to the antenna. One of those particularly needed for the Voyager spacecraft, others that will be used for future missions to Mars and humans returning to the moon and so on. And also a complete electrical upgrade, power, cooling systems, uh, refurbishment of the base pedestal. So literally a top to bottom, inside out repair and upgrade of the dish. And what people don't often realise, especially our Australian listeners, because they hear a lot about the CSIRO's Parkes radio telescope, the 64 metre dish there. This one's actually bigger. Yes, yeah, so uh, the... This at Tibbenbilla at our tracking station is the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, 70 metres in diameter, about the height of a 22-storey building, and just a dish in its moving structure weighs some 4,000 tonnes that it can be moved with hair width precision at any point in the sky to communicate with spacecraft hundreds of millions, billions of kilometres away. Is the refurbishment process a big job? It has been. So the entire project is 11 months for the upgrades of the antenna. So there's still eight months, which... It's certainly been impacted by things like COVID and other uh, bushfires and other factors of 2020. Uh, it has entailed well over 250 people, different contractors, our own engineers, technicians, uh, experts coming over from the Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena, California, all to do this work on this really great workforce of the of space exploration, our big dish in Canberra, and our Literally, our CSRO team have been working day and night, seven days a week, to get the antenna to where it is now and to also make sure it's completely back online, ready to do its job for some of the missions arriving at Mars in February next year to get those next few months to make sure it's all ready to go. Yeah, Perseverance just passed the halfway mark, I believe. Yes, that's correct. So we continue to track Perseverance on its journey to Mars and also the United Arab Emirates mission, HOPE, which is also going to enter Mars orbit around the same time period as Perseverance landing on the surface. Tell us about Tidbin Billa or the Deep Space Network Canberra Station as, as NASA call it. So the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex of course is a part of NASA's Deep Space Network. There's three stations around the planet separated by about a third of the world each to provide the 24-7 communication with all the dozens of robotic space missions that are out across the solar system. So when we talk about deep space where we're talking about things 100,000 kilometres and beyond. So there are two other networks that handle the much closer stuff, and Earth orbiting satellites and geostationary satellites. We really handle everything else. The universe is our backyard. So by being able to have these antennas spread around the planet and provide this 24-7 communication, sending commands so the spacecraft know where to go and what to do, more information to collect and then send back home, we can then process that, put it back through the Jet Propulsion Labs in California to then distribute it to tens of thousands of scientists around the world. So we have our big 70-metre dish, of course, going through the upgrades right now. We have three 34-metre diameter antennas. And over the next few years, we hope to be able to build at least one more antenna, simply because of the enormous number of spacecraft planning to go out there. We literally need more ears on space to be able to communicate with them. And it's not just the dishes you have. You've got a fair bit of history there too, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so the station has been operating since 1965, although we started to do our very first tracking 
back in 1964 with NASA's Mariner 4 spacecraft, which made the first close-up flyby of Mars and taking pictures of that world. In fact, those first pictures were received at our station back in July 1965. Pictures coming back were pretty good, started a very stark surface, crater-filled. Later missions, of course, yeah, there were times when completely the planet was covered uh, in this global dust storm. So Mars is a dynamic world, but we know it's so much better now because of all of the different missions that have gone there over the decades, from the Viking missions and now all of the rovers that are on the surface and other orbiting spacecraft there. We really consider Mars the, the traffic jam of the solar system right now with eight missions currently active there and three more on their way right now. And, uh, of course, we've handled all of the uh, the Apollo missions, for the first human missions to the moon. We've handled missions, dozens and dozens of missions to Mars, to the giant planets of our solar system, to asteroids and comets. And, of course, deep space, deep space telescopes looking out into the far reaches of our universe. And we're still, of course, capable of talking to both of NASA's Voyager spacecraft and most distant robotic ambassadors out in the universe. You've also got some remnants from a, another NASA tracking station at Honeysuckle Creek. Yes, yeah, so originally there were seven space tracking stations in Australia. There were two in Western Australia, one in South Australia, one in Queensland, and three stations here in Canberra in the ACT. So our station at Tivan Villa, a station at a place called the Rural Valley, and a third station, Honeysuckle Creek, which was a station especially set up to support the Apollo missions. And our Tiv and Villa station had a wing to that so that we could also provide backup support and support communication with the astronauts and telemetry of the spacecraft. But back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, consolidation of the tracking stations meant that those sites were closed down around the country. It's just our station left at Tiv and Villa now. But we didn't get rid of the dish from Honeysuckle Creek. It was the dish that received and broadcast to the world, those very first pictures. Armstrong stepping onto the surface of the moon. Uh, great antenna, the great legacy was eventually, when Honeysuckle was closed in 1981, the dish was dismantled, moved to the site of Tiffin Villa, reconstructed there, and continued to do great work for us, communicating with spacecraft every day until its final retirement back in 2010. And of course, you've got a visitor centre as well. Yes, we have a visitor centre there. About 70,000 people a year come along to see what we do out at this tracking station, the great views of the complex and what we do. There's lots of displays of Mars missions and all the missions of the planets and theaters and so forth. We've got lots of great pieces of space history, but probably our most prized possession is an actual piece of moon rock collected on the Apollo 11 mission. It's 3.8 billion years old. It's part of the lunar surface, a bit of lunar basalt. So helping us understand more about the early molten history of our near neighbour out there in space. And I love this particular piece. It was picked up off the surface moon by Buzz Aldrin and uh, given to us as a thank you gift for all the important work that Australia has done in space exploration over the last last 60 years. I take it no one's ever allowed to touch it? Yeah, so this particular moon rock is kept in a a medically sealed case to basically protect it from moisture in our atmosphere and our atmosphere itself so that the rock doesn't degrade. It's kept in a special a security case, so you get really up close to it, you're literally just centimetres away from it, but we want to make sure that we can keep that pristine so that future generations can enjoy it. And uh, what does it look like? So it's about the size of a duck egg, so about 147 grams. Uh, it's a dark grey in appearance, it has lots of little small holes in it, little vesicles left over from bubbles of gas that were trapped inside the rock during its molten state, and then lots of sparkling stuff throughout. It almost looks like tiny glitter has been thrown all over the rock. And that is, in fact, volcanic rock glass, part of the crystallization process as that rock cooled and hardened 3.8 billion years ago, primarily silica in its content. Look under a microscope, it looks sort of black and orange, in fact, but to the eye and just light shining off, it's just this bright little shining Aladdin cave of silvery crystals on the surface. It really is a beautiful piece of uh, Lunar Rock. That's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, astronomers discover a rare active centaur in the dark expanse of the outer solar system. And we look at the meaning of the term blue moon. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
astronomers have discovered a rare active centaur in the dark expanse of the outer solar system. The discovery, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, may help uncover one of the secrets explaining how they can be active so far from the Sun, where water is frozen as solid as the hardest ice. Centaurs are tiny frozen bodies, wandering through the vast empty spaces between the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. They're believed to originate even further out in the Kuiper Belt, a ring of frozen worlds, icy debris and comets circling the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Centaurs occasionally show signs of activity, developing comet-like features such as a coma and tails. Comets develop these features when water ices and other volatiles they contain begin to heat up and sublimate from frozen solids into gases as they get closer to the Sun. But centaurs orbit in a region of space where it's far too cold for water to readily sublimate. Only 18 active centaurs have been discovered since 1927, and much about them remains poorly understood. Discovering activity on centaurs is also observationally challenging because they're faint, telescope time intensive, and because they're very rare. The authors developed a database search algorithm to locate archival images of centaurs, then undertake follow-up observational campaigns. While studying archival images of a centaur, catalogued as 2014 OG392, which was first discovered in 2014, the authors noticed a coma emanating from the nucleus of the centaur, stretching out some 400,000 kilometres. One of the study's authors, Colin Chandler from North Arizona University, says their technique used observational measurements for things like colour and dust mass, combined with modelling efforts to estimate the characteristics of the object's volatile sublimation and orbital dynamics. Chandler and colleagues then combined this data with new observations acquired using the Dark Energy Camera at the Inter-American Observatory in Chile, the Walter Bade Telescope at the Las Campos Observatory also in Chile, and the Large Monolithic Imager at the Lowell Observatory's Discovery Channel Telescope in Arizona. The authors analysed the Centaur's sublimation processes and dynamical lifetime leading them to conclude that the activity was likely being caused by the degassing of carbon dioxide and or ammonia. As a result of the team's discovery, the Centaur has now been reclassified as a comet and will from now on be known as C2014 OG392 Panstars. This is Space Time. Still to come, we look at the meaning of a blue moon, And later in the science report, the year 2020 now on track to become one of the warmest years on record. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, because of COVID-19, I guess like me, you thought this year's Halloween was probably a bit of a dumper. But what did make it interesting was the fact that it occurred on a blue moon. Now, anyone who bothered to look as twilight descended on All Hallows' Eve would have noted that the moon didn't really turn blue, but remained its usual whitish-yellowish colour. So, why do they call it a blue moon? Well, the term refers to whenever there are two full moons in the same calendar month, and October had two full moons in it, the first being on October 1st. OK, I guess most of you already knew that. But why do they call it a blue moon, rather than something else? It seems the modern-day usage of the term blue moon to refer to the second full moon of a month wasn't always the case. This colourful term's actually a calendrical goof that worked its way into the pages of Sky and Telescope magazine back in March 1946 and then spread to the rest of the world from there. The magazine's observing editor, Diana Hannah-Kanan, says the historical term blue moon was more often not an astronomical term. In older songs, it was used as a symbol of sadness, of loneliness, while once in a blue moon was used colloquially to mean a rare event, which after all is what two full moons in the one month really is. Only exceedingly rarely does the moon actually turn blue in the sky. That usually happens in association with rarely scattering. Fires or volcanic eruptions release particles into the atmosphere of just the right size to preferentially scatter red light. Editors and contributors to Sky Telescope magazine have traced the traditional astronomical definition to the main farmer's almanac of the late 1930s. The almanac, it would seem, 
consistently use the term to refer to the third full moon in a season containing four full moons rather than the usual three. But in 1946, amateur astronomer and frequent contributor to Sky and Telescope magazine, James Hugh Pruitt, incorrectly interpreted the almanac's description and the second full moon in the one calendar month usage was born. Sky and Telescope magazine finally admitted to its blue moon blooper in its May 1999 issue. The earliest recorded English usage of the term blue moon is found in an anti-clerical pamphlet attacking the Roman clergy, and Cardinal Thomas Wolseley in particular, by a pair of Greenwich friars, William Roy and Jerome Barlow, back in 1528, under the title, Read me and be not wroth, for I say no thingy but troth. The relevant passage actually reads, O oh, churchmen and wily foxes, if they say the moon be blue, we must believe that it's true. The intention appears to be that one's forced to believe anything the priest says, even if it's clearly and absurdly false. Still, by any definition, blue moons are still rare. They happen, on average, about once every 2.7 years. You'll need to wait until August 2023 for the next blue moon. Historically, moons were named after the month they appeared in, and traditional Old English month names were equated with the names of the Julian calendar soon after Christendom. But over the centuries, different cultures have each developed their own names to describe each new moon and these are usually associated with a specific event occurring at that time of year. For example, the Harvest Moon and the Hunter's Moon are traditional names used for full moons in the late summer and the autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, usually in September and October respectively. The Harvest Moon is the full moon nearest to the Northern Autumnal Equinox in September, with the Hunter's Moon being the full moon that follows it in October. Now, depending on where you lived in the world, November has its beaver moon, turkey moon and frosty moon. The long night's moon was the last full moon of the year and the one nearest the winter solstice in December. The first full moon of January was referred to as the ice moon, the winter moon or sometimes the wolf moon, again depending on your location. February saw the snow moon, the storm moon or even the hunger moon. I guess that depends on how much food was left in winter storage. March was traditionally the spring, crow or seed moons. April would see the pink or egg moons. While depending on where you lived, May brought with it the milk, strawberry or mother's moon. June had its mead or rose moons. As you'd expect, July was the time of the summer moon. And August was marked by the corn, sturgeon or barley moon. And yes, lunar eclipses which always occur on a full moon and often cause the moon to have a reddish hue to it are sometimes referred to as blood moons. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The World Meteorological Organization says 2020 remains on track to be one of the warmest years on record, despite the formation of a La Nina weather pattern. The organization says La Nina typically has a cooling effect on global temperatures, but this is being more than offset by the amount of heat trapped in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. La Nina refers to a large-scale cooling of ocean surface temperatures in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific coupled with changes in tropical atmospheric circulation involving winds, pressure and rainfall. It usually has the opposite effect of an El Nino on weather and climate. El Nino is a warm phase caused by the so-called El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. The World Meteorological Organization's new update says there's a 90% likelihood of tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures remaining at La Nina levels through to the end of this year and a 55% likelihood of that continuing for at least the first quarter of 2021. This year's La Nina is expected to be moderate to strong. The last time there was a strong La Nina event was back in 2010 and 2011. That was followed by a moderate event in 2011 and 2012. New modelling suggests that more than half a million US lives could be lost to COVID-19 by the end of February 2021. But that number could be significantly reduced if 95% of Americans always wore a face mask in public. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Medicine, demonstrate how almost 130,000 people could be saved if local, state and federal governments in the US had ordered universal face masking. 
scientists analysed the spread of the coronavirus from the first test case to the end of September this year. They modelled different scenarios to see how non-pharmaceutical interventions like wearing a face mask might impact in coming months. They found that even if 85% of the population consistently face masked, they estimate that around 95,000 lives could still be saved by the end of February. So far, more than 1.3 million people have been killed and almost 50 million infected by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first began spreading out of China to the rest of the world a year ago. OK, be honest, how many of you pull out your phones while at the same time watching TV? Well, a new study reported in the journal Nature found that multi-screening may be bad for your memory. Scientists have found a link between multi-screening and being forgetful. The study's authors say a group of young adults were more likely to show an increase in attention lapses and score badly in memory tests when they reported frequently using multiple devices at the same time, such as their laptops, phone and television. Now, the authors can't prove that scrolling through Insta while cruising Tumblr and streaming Netflix will directly affect your memory. But their research does offer a caution to all those who, like me, tend to split our digital focus. Scientists have discovered that platypus fur glows green under ultraviolet light. The findings reported in the journal Mammalia represent the first observation of biofluorescence in an egg-laying mammal monotrine suggesting that this extraordinary trait may not be as rare as previously thought. Only two other mammals, the opossum and the flying squirrel, are known to have fur that bioluminesces under ultraviolet light. In visible light, platypus fur appears brown. But under ultraviolet light, scientists at the Food Museum in Chicago discovered that it fluoresced green or even cyan. Like the marsupial opossum and the placental flying squirrel, platypuses, or is it platypi, are mostly active during the night and at dawn and dusk. Every now and then, the world of the Australian sceptics come across some stories which are so bizarre and so out there that they really do deserve a wider audience. It seems a well-known local psychic claims aliens told her that the Premier of the Australian state of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, has been arrested, locked up in Guantanamo Bay and replaced by a clone. Now, in Australia, a Premier is the House Majority Leader in the House of Representatives in the State Legislature or Parliament. That makes him or her the political leader of the government of that state under the Australian parliamentary system. And Daniel Andrews has achieved a lot of notoriety of late for keeping his state in strict COVID-19 lockdown longer than just about anywhere else in the free world. And this psychic claims she knows what's really been going on, as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics explains. Well, the, the shock horror uh, revelation is that of Dan Andrews that we know is actually a clone and that the real Dan Andrews is currently sitting out in Guantanamo Bay. Now, what's the logic uh, behind that? <laughs> This is from a psychic lady who uh, is picking up information from aliens All right. um, who are communicating things to her about all different things. And they told her that Dan Andrews is not, the we know, is not the real one. The one we see on TV every day uh, talking about the problem in Victoria is not the real one. That he is, uh, as you say, sitting out in Guantanamo Bay. She's a strange person, this one. Um, this is a former Sydney nurse, 39-year-old, first name Kerry Ann. We won't mention her surname. And uh, this is a person who used to be responsible for the health of people. That's a, that's a bit of a concern. Her body channeling messages from extraterrestrials, who she calls her team. They have evidence of everything. Um, that's when uh, that Dan Andrews was arrested and uh, and put in Gitmo, as she calls. She also thinks that uh, coronavirus is um, a bit overrated. Do you um, know why he was arrested and put in Gitmo? No. No, oh, right. no we doesn't don't. Go <laughs> no, it doesn't go that far. Yeah. And, and they went to all the trouble to replace him with the clone. They, but when they put the clone in, they, they didn't fix up the ear problem. The ears are still the same. <laughs> What's a perfect clone, mate? I mean, if you're going to make a clone... It looks like a VW with its doors open. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Daniel. <laughs> you're a cruel man. Um, but uh, yes, okay, but they cloned everything. It's a strange thing, and you really feel for this particular person. Yeah, it's a silly story. It's so silly that um, you really feel... I don't think anyone apart from this particular lady would take it seriously. But she did have a, a an online session in which she was talking to her customers and followers and uh, charging them $20 a head. And uh, she was going to uh, reveal a lot of information about aliens and her team. I don't think she did. Oh, 
Oh, but, that, that came as a shock. But she did point out that not only is Daniel Andrews a clone, but apparently the Kate Middleton, the future queen to be or something, was actually a shapeshifter and she's uh, part of an alien race. Oh. It's uh, sad. Uh, okay, of course, it's not the silliest story of the week by any means. Tell us about the elephant head on Mars. <sighs> How many things have they seen on Mars? How many sort of particular Well, I remember the, the Sphinx's face on Mars. I thought that was really cool. And the pyramid the, the, there, this is all in Sidonia region. There's this pyramid. There's this ruined city. There was this face looking like a Sphinx looking back at Earth. When you're a 14-year-old kid and you see this sort of stuff, you think, wow, this is amazing. And then you realise there's this thing called pareidolia and uh, light and shadow from different angles of sunlight and and your world sort of falls apart at that stage. But in the meantime, it's good to know that tradition continues. <laughs> You're such a sceptic. Um, basically, you know, yeah, pareidolia where you see shapes, especially faces and things, in things. And as someone points out, part of the man in the moon, which is the classic one that people can see, you see faces in clouds or shapes in clouds. And if you look at a PowerPoint on, on your wall, you'll see a face depending on which country you're in, it might be a sad yeah, face or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever. But, I mean, uh, this particular one was an elephant. Actually, it's an elephant head and trunk, and it does look like an elephant head. It and does. It does indeed. Yeah, it does look like that. To me, it also looks like what happens when you tread on a tube of toothpaste. Uh, <laughs> it also probably looks like uh, one light rock in front of a dark rock, and just the dark rock is bigger than the white rock, so it's, you can see a shape around the, the front rock. So... People see this all the time, but yeah, and they keep doing it. Then again, there was a case recently of a huge alien seen on Antarctica. Uh, it's all... <laughs> alien versus predator. It was a 20-foot-high humanoid figure in Antarctica, so people will see. You know, oh, no, the... no, no, <laughs> that's a Wookiee, and that's the ice planet Hoth. <sighs> right, okay. And that's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 